Hi everyone, Jonathan here again with what looks like an ordinary M1 Garand rifle. Um, as you've probably guessed, it is not an ordinary M1 Garand rifle. I suppose the first thing to say is that it is a gas trap Garand. So those of you who know the type, the very um, early examples that were produced, not just prototypes, but um, examples that were issued, several thousand at least, I believe, had an early form of gas system um, where the propellant gases, after the bullet has passed, were tapped off at the muzzle. Um, that was altered midway through, well, partway through manufacture for what we now know as a conventional gas port system. So this whole area here, including this distinctive shape of front sight, very, very flat sides, is indicative of a gas trap Garand. But that's not why we're looking at this example here today. This is a unique example of the M1 Garand with a specifically British provenance. Uh, serial number 7114, which again shows you that it's early. And the only giveaway for this is a quite thick steel plate on the right hand side of the receiver or the body as we call it in British, British parlance. Um, there's a hole in that plate and a little bit of wood cut away in the stock. You might start to guess where we're going with this. Let me just show you how, just how thick that is. It's essentially a receiver extension widening the receiver. So what could that be? Well, if we fast forward to, well, if we initially fast forward to the 1950s, there's a concept called the light automatic rifle. Um, this, this ties into the whole British EM2 story and what ended up being for the Americans the M14, which is the M1 Garand in 7.62 NATO instead of 30 6 as this is, with a new gas system, with a box magazine, and with the ability for automatic fire, hence light automatic rifle. Now these light automatic rifles, um, unlike the sort of parallel concept of the assault rifle with a reduced power cartridge, were neither uh, neither light nor were they controllable on automatic. Um, so they, they, were, they were a problematic category of, of firearm. And this represents a very early attempt to create one for experimental purposes only. So this example was procured in 1939 Something major was going on in 1939, or was going to by the end of the year. Um, and of course, uh, the British government, British, British forces knew, knew very well where things might be going. So they're looking at, um, and they're looking at new concepts all the time anyway. So the idea was, well, firstly, let's get hold of this um, splendid new American self-loading rifle, because we don't have anything as good as that, and put it through its paces. And secondly, someone had the idea of converting this um, and a Czech ZH-29, uh, both of these were, were on uh, sort of test and evaluation to see where technology was going, convert both of those to automatic fire, which is a bit bonkers, frankly. Um, only eight rounds in the internal uh, magazine of the, of the Karand, so eight rounds is gonna go pretty, pretty quickly. Now there are American experiments along these lines as well. I'll let my American friends uh, pick that up in possibly videos that already exist. Um, certainly there's some material out there online and in books about um, American arsenal experiments with automatic Garands. They were mainly geared toward developing that M14, what became the M14. Um, this is uh, unrelated to that. This is a British experiment to see how controllable automatic rifles in a full power cartridge might be. Bearing in mind that in 1939 we didn't yet have reduced power cartridges that weren't pistol cartridges. Uh, now the fun bit for me, um, possibly for you as well, is the nickname or the, or the sort of unofficial code name that the Garand received. Uh, it doesn't just apply to this converted one, it applies to the M1 Garand, uh, the British experience of the M1 Garand across the, across the board and it was, it was nicknamed in the documents, it's actually in the trials documents, YSL. So you'll see that the ZH-29 appears as ZH-29. Um, the M1 Garand is euphemistically referred to as YSL. No, nope, doesn't stand for Yves Saint Laurent. Yankee self-loader is what this was called. 
which is just classic British humor. Like this, this thing's amazing. It's better than any rifle that we've we've got or can conceive of at the time, and we have to kind of um, grudgingly, respectfully slash disrespectfully call it the, the Yankee self-loader. Apologies to my Southern American friends as well. Yankee means something different um, here than it does there. I just think that's fantastic. Uh, nice little bit of history there. So these trials in May 1939 at Hythe, what did they find? Well, kind of what you'd expect, to be honest. Um, we've got so at 50 yards. These were the burst fire at 50 yards, quote, it is clear that highly trained men cannot hold on a target 12 feet by 8 feet for a burst of more than two or three rounds. In the hands of the average shot, the second round is frequently above the target. So that applied to both of the converted rifles, the Czech and the American. Functioning was found to be uh, good with the, gar with the Garand, um, or Garand, unlike the ZH-29, but, quote, Accuracy was even worse than with the ZH-29 due to the higher rate of fire. And we've got the uh, statistics there that, that we, can, we can show you. But yeah, as they, they basically sum it up by saying that if you're, an, if you're an average shot, your first shot's on, the second one is already off the target. And, and this just this con confirms retrospectively what we know very well today, that you just don't bother with automatic fire with full power rifles. You need an, ass an assault rifle or you need a submachine gun if you're gonna fire burst. Uh, you're gonna be wondering about rate of fire. Well, unfortunately, they only recorded a rate of fire for the ZH-29 and that was 600 rounds per minute, which seems very slow to me. That's kind of Sten gun, Bren gun rate, quite controllable, you would have thought. We only know that the Garand was higher than that. Now, as the M14 with the selector switch Bearing in mind, most M14s were never issued with their selector switch for the same reason, that it's pointless. Uh, that runs at about 7 to 750 RPM. So we can anticipate that, albeit different gas system, this probably ran about 700. So, yeah, that, that, that's the sort of rate of fire of, say, an SA-80, an, an M16. Controllable for a short burst? Wouldn't be with this thing. And they concluded by saying... It is not considered that any self-loader converted to fully automatic fire would be of any use to the service and would be dangerous to put into the hands of the average private soldier. So it, it kind of proved the obvious, um, but we, we learned an early lesson there, and that probably informed British development of automatic rifles in the late 1940s, which led us to the EM2 and that whole story, which we won't rehash here. Now, after that trial was concluded, uh, lit literally in the trial report, um, it's requested that the two rifles be returned to their original configuration. After all, they only had one of each at that time, the Garand and the ZH-29, and that's the configuration that this is now in. So it was once automatic. You have the sort of archaeological evidence of the conversion, but the trigger mechanism was returned to self-loading only because they still had trials to, be to do with it, no doubt. And if anyone needed to see how a Garand worked, they needed a working gun, not one that had been rendered essentially unsafe by making it fully automatic. So I'm sure those of you with a, a more technical mind are itching to see what it looks like inside and how they've made enough space for the trigger mechanism with a, an additional um, disconnector. That's the main component you need, really. It's easy to make a, a, a firearm, to design a firearm that's automatic or redesign it in this case. It's harder to, to come up with the componentry to interrupt it between shots. So we can't show you the mechanism because it's been removed, um, or the original mechanism has been reinstalled. We can show you a little bit of what's inside. And we also are fortunate to have it in the archive, a drawing showing you the components that have to be added to this to make it automatic. So we'll show you both of those. So let's just partially disassemble this rare example, unique example, of, of a British automatic Garand, or, or it was at once anyway. But first of all, I just want to point out, so, so here again is our, our plate here that's um, helping to accommodate the mechanism inside. Now there's a very slight hint here, of, as, as well as the hole for the selector, there are actually two steel pins that have been driven into place to keep this thing securely in place and they've been ground flush, polished, finished, 
So you barely see that they were there, but there is just the ghost of those two pins there. We'll, we'll see more evidence of those when we open it up. Um, so let's do that. Just pop out the very neat unitary trigger mechanism of the, of the Garand, which is a, it was always a, a good design. Um, this is absolutely standard early Garand. So it's of, of interest to, to Garand specialists, but it has nothing, it no longer has anything of its um, fully automatic capability in evidence. Um, incidentally, thank you very much to Paul Getty of the Garand Collectors Association for all of his help uh, with this uh, back when I originally got interested in it and discovered that we had it. That should let us pop off the wooden stock. This is all standard um, Garand. And that gives us, well, nothing too spectacular, I'm afraid, because all they've done here, and if I grab, if I grab a normal, uh, albeit later production, Garand receiver, you can see here roughly what they've done. So side by side here with an intact Garand receiver. Now there will, there will be minor differences here. This is a later build standard. Um, so don't, don't start looking for differences <laughs> or do, it's up to you, but um, that's not what we're, what we're looking at here. What we're looking at is the milled out inside of this receiver. It's very slight. All they've done is taken off the, the sort of shoulder here and this angle here has been sort of curtailed by being machined away. And it's this portion here that accommodates the bulk of that um, select fire mechanism, which we can show you the drawing of. And hopefully between the real estate that this has given them, just, just a bit more to let them uh, fit into there and then uh, reinforcement of the receiver to make up for how thin they've made this That's really what's going on here. Hopefully between those two things you can get a sense of how this might have worked It would be a really interesting and fun project to uh, CNC up <laughs> um, or sorry um, CAD uh, up the uh, components based on those uh, drawings and to try and drop them in uh, and sort of recreate what this thing would have looked like, even if we can't get it running with actual steel components. Uh, because I think even if we could, it might be a little hairy <laughs> to actually shoot. Thanks as always for watching guys. I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, we're here every week and you can also play along over on social media before the video actually drops. That's on Facebook and Instagram. We have a Twitter account as well that you might want to look at. Uh, our website is pretty important if you actually want to come and visit us because we are open at our three sites. Um, so I hope you are able to visit us. If you're not, we'll see you again next time. Thanks very much.